uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you very much for having me. Oh, the, um, where's the screen? Okay, so we try once more. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much for having me, and also thank you very much to Carthy, who was willing to work on this, even though he had a new, new job already. So let's uh, get right to it. Um, what is a puff? Uh, you, you heard that before in the previous talk, but here we will be having a slightly different perspective. So as before, we have a, a stimulus. We apply to puff object, with, which is somewhat random due to a random um, manufacturing variations. And out of that, we get a response. And we have two easy properties that we want to have. So one is it needs to be easy to evaluate and hard to predict. So this sounds really like a great thing to have in, in hardware crypto. So let's go on and use it. So uh, one of the most popular puffs is the so-called SRAM puff. So here you uh, have the SRAM in a non isomeric state. And if you powered it up, then you have a random fingerprint in there. So you have your system on chip. You have some ALU. You apply the stimulus and out comes the somewhat random fingerprint. So this is um, due to the construction of how an SRAM works. It's, it's already a binary response. So the basic idea of these types of puffs are that you have a key derivation from a response instead of key storage. So the advantage is that if you do the delayering and the optical analysis of the SOC, you cannot reveal the key. Because if you do that, you just see the SRAM, but you don't see the key. So the, the disadvantages are that uh, this response that you get off the, out of the puff, somewhat noisy, so you need some, some error correction and helper data to work around that. But let's not focus too much on that for now. So what about puffs and, and probing? So now we have the same SOC as before, and uh, now we have some invasive probing on some data bus or the probing on the puff directly. And, um, well, this is just the example of invasive probing, but of course there are also some, some other physical attacks. And uh, thanks to Shahin, there's uh, also some, some work that we can look at and uh, study. And uh, I think what is quite interesting here is that uh, the previous approach usually was to make a puff as small as possible and then put it somewhere in your system on chip. But of course, in, in that case, uh, what about the rest of the SOC? And um, I guess it's, it's not too surprising that this is a, a, a misconception. So if you use a puff in that scenario, you're not secured. And uh, thanks to Shahin, we have uh, a lot of practical proof that this is indeed not the case. So it's, it's not claimed, and I think it's also not designed to resist attacks if you have an SRAM puff, and then you probe the data bus. So uh, we have different perspectives here. So one is uh, on the puff, the other one on the system. So most puffs are not protect, uh, protecting from live physical, physical attacks when you probe the data bus. They are simply not tamper evident, and then you need some, some other countermeasures, such as meshes. So what's the idea of a tamper evident puff? Instead of making the puff as small as possible, we now make it as big as possible and make it cover everything. So uh, now when we do the probing, we destroy parts of the puff, and this in turn causes the key derivation to fail. So some underlying assumptions are, of course, that the puff somehow encloses the system, it's somehow sensitive to tempering, and of course it needs to protect itself also. So what's underneath needs to be protected. So this is uh, what is called a tamper-evident puff, and there are not too many examples, so I just listed uh, three of them. One was also presented at Chess 2006, so it's actually quite dated, but I, I still like that a lot. So the token puff, I can really recommend you to read the paper. So when it comes to key derivation, uh, we have now two scenarios. So one is we have the puff response, which is uh, binary uh, for most puffs, and then we have the tamper evident case. Uh, let's talk about that in a second. First, let's uh, get back to the binary case. Here, a, uh, an assumption that is typically made is that the puff bits are IID. And if there is some bias, we can do some debiasing, and if there is noise, then uh, we can apply some binary ECC constructions such as the fuzzy commitment or code offset. But now if we look at the uh, almost uh, continuous or quasi-continuous uh, case for the tamper-evident puff, the question is, what is the best approach to use here? 
Um, so as an engineer myself, of course you look at it and uh, okay, so do we just throw an ECC at it? No, we start using a quantization first. So there are two uh, well-known examples for the quantization. So one is the equiprobable and the other one is the equidistant. For the equi equiprobable quantization, what you do is uh, some kind of histogram equalization. So each one of these intervals occurs with equal probability. So now what the authors of the coating puff did was to assign a gray code to neighboring intervals such that the uh, bit difference between neighboring intervals is always just one bit. But as you can see already, if I go from the very left interval to the very right interval, the bit difference is also just, just, just one bit. So if I apply the equiprobable quantization, the results are also IID bits. Uh, there is no bias because all the intervals occur with equal probability, so do the bits. So this is a real nice scenario for doing puff key generation. And uh, for the remaining noise, I can then use some, some binary ECC. So um, once we apply that, we basically map back the problem to the binary scenario and we're done. There's no, uh, nothing we need to do. Now, if we look at the equidistant quantization uh, and we start assigning symbols to the uh, equal, evenly sized uh, intervals, so A, B, C, D, and so on, then of course we have symbols and no longer bits at all. Of course, we can start encoding these bits, uh, but at first we start with the symbols because then we have some more options as we'll see on the upcoming slides. Uh, these symbols are quite biased, as you can tell from, from the PDF. And of course, for the noise, again, we need to, to apply some ECC. So uh, why on earth uh, would we want to use equidistant over equiprobable? Um, but of course, there's always a small catch. So if we look at uh, equiprobable quantization in terms of uh, tamper sensitivity, then what we see is that we have uh, uh, differently sized intervals, so the um, outermost intervals are rather large. And uh, if we look at one sample from that PDF and we start measuring it, then we usually have some measurement noise. And if we want uh, this to work in a temper evident context, the typical assumption is that the noise is much smaller than the magnitude change induced by the attacker. So in this uh, uh, simple example, uh, the noise is just uh, just one bracket and the attacker is five brackets. So I can just shift the value from here to there, but it would still map to the same bit string. So uh, in these large intervals, I can attack uh, without changing the value. So uh, that kind of defeats the purpose of having a tamper evident puff. Um, so, th so that's one of the issues. Another issue is the missing selectivity of uh, binary ECC responses uh, with multiple values. So in case of the coating puff uh, or other tamper evident puffs, we might have a couple of capacitors that we use as tamper evident puff structure. Now we do the quantization and uh, we get some bit sequence and now we look at the reconstruction. So someone has, was attacking that puff and inducing errors in my puff structure. So case one, we now have one capacitor that, that was completely destroyed, so all the, the bits changed. In case two, we have three different capacitors, whereas each uh, position only one bit changed. And in case three, we have one position with two bits and the other one with just one bit. Now if we apply just, uh, let's say, the standard ECC binary construction where we correct uh, three errors, then in all these cases, we map back to the uh, case of the enrollment. Uh, which of course is good since you do error correction, but at the same time, you also correct the error induced by the physical attack. So uh, that's another issue of, of, of this type of approach, which is also uh, the same if you would be using an equidistant uh, quantization. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the uh, bit string per capacitor is just, just three bits and you, we had at eight intervals. And as you saw in the figure before, uh, there are some large magnitude errors possible where uh, the um, hemming distance is just one. So uh, what we really need is, uh, if we look at puff key derivation, that uh, we not only look at reliability and entropy, but also somehow uh, make tamper sensitivity part of that picture. So uh, usually if you look at um, puffs that are implemented at the IC level, you look at helper data storage, logic area, and runtime parameters such as energy efficiency or runtime. And for the security, reliability, and entropy. But temper sensitivity was not part of that. 
So instead of uh, making tufts small and lightweight, we really need a different approach for tamper-evident tufts where we make them tamper-evident, large, and secure. So to do that and to provide a fair comparison, um, there are two de definitions, um, really easy ones. So uh, there is the maximum uh, magnitude uh, temper uh, sensitivity, which is the maximum magnitude that goes undetected. So as someone defending the system, this is the worst case scenario because the attacker is allowed the maximum magnitude without changing uh, the, the tough outcome. And then we also have the minimum magnitude temper sensitivity, which is the minimum magnitude that we detect. So this is kind of the, the best case, so the earliest uh, shift that we're going to uh, detect. And uh, to um, allow comparison between different schemes, we need some unit that we use to express uh, the magnitude of that shift the attacker induces. And uh, since it's a puff, uh, what is quite useful is to use the measurement noise uh, sigma n. And then the kind of practically best physical security we can achieve is if these two metrics are the same and close to one, which would be equal to the uh, noise of the puff measurement. So now we have different options that we can use. So uh, we start with the raw output. We can go up uh, for the equiprobable quantization. Uh, then we have the binary gray coded string and then we can apply uh, some ECC over Hamming distance, which is called profile five in the, in the next table. Then uh, we have the equidistant quantization. We get some symbols. Uh, of course, we can map them back to, to bits of a fixed length, and then this is what we call profile three. Then we have symbols. We can map them to bits of a variable length. And then uh, something, let's say, uh, unusual uh, needs to be done. We need to do the ECC over the Levenstein distance because you not only have substitution errors, but also insertions and deletions. Uh, of course, we can also use a Q-area ECC over Hamming distance and a Q-area ECC over Lee distance. So I, I think you're all familiar with Hamming distance. Uh, Levenstein distance, I just very briefly introduced. And what we will focus on and what is part of the proposal in the paper is that we do Q-area ECC over Lee distance based on the output of the equidistant quantization. So... Uh, in the binary case, what you typically see in a puff paper is the binary symmetric channel. So now what we're looking at is the Q-ary channel. So uh, these symbols, uh, zero to Q minus one, and this shows the uh, transition probability to all the others. And uh, we have the, the solid lines and the dashed lines. And now when we look at lead distance, there are two different scenarios that we need to consider. So if we just look at the, the solid lines, uh, without the dashed line, then this is what we call the non-wraparound channel because from Q minus one back to zero, we have the distance of Q minus one, whereas when we have the dashed line, it's called the wraparound channel, and then uh, the distance between Q minus one and zero is, is just one. So in case of the uh, temper evidence scenario, we definitely want to use the non-wraparound channel, which is also then called Manhattan distance, so just to be clear, when I say Lee distance or Manhattan distance, I, I generally refer to the non-wraparound uh, channel. So uh, there are different uh, limited magnitude types. Uh, so one is called the asymmetric case. So uh, green is our designated value and, and red is the error magnitude. And here we can be really selective. So in the asymmetric case, we only correct errors to the right. In the symmetric case, we correct uh, errors to the left and right of equal magnitude, and then we also have the bidirectional case where these two magnitudes in opposite direction can be even of, of different magnitude. Now, if we look at the, the, the PDF of, of our puff, and we have some, some symbol here, then of course, if we look at LD and LU, we just look basically at the neighboring intervals if LU and LD is one. So that's a very narrow um, frame that we correct here and that is what we want. So uh, now uh, these are the results that we got from our comparison. I'll walk you through, no worries. <laughs> so um, we use the coating puff parameters and then we have six profiles. The first profile is just based on the equidistant quantization. So we set a certain width for the quantization interval. Then we have a number of intervals. Then uh, these are the, all the blocks uh, that, that we need to process. We don't have an ECC. And then the entropy we get out is 267 uh, bits. And um, now the newly defined metric for temper sensitivity per node, so that's just one capacitor, in this case is the width 
defined for the quantization. And for the whole device, we just sum up all the, the magnitude that we are allowed to do without being detected, which in this case is sigma root 92 and the unit is sigma n. And the distance metric is none. So for prof profile two, what we used was the fuzzy commitment based um, uh, puff uh, ECC uh, using an RS code. So in that case, the entropy is much lower, the temperature sensitivity is, is uh, much less, so the numbers here are much higher. And we used Hamming distance over symbols. So the distance between the symbol A and the symbol D would be one, uh, same as the, the distance between um, A and D. Then we have uh, the, the binary case. So now we map back the symbols to the, the binary scenario. We use a DCH code correspondingly. We get much more bits out. So this is based on a code offset construction, but still uh, the temper sensitivity is, is much less compared to the uh, quantization approach alone, which is a little bit surprising. Uh, then we have profile four. Here we use the uh, VT codes to deal with the insertion and deletions. So bit strings of variable length. Uh, we get many bits out. Uh, the temper sensitivity per node is still not as good as just using the quantization and uh, it's almost equal for the whole device. Now, profile one is based on the equiprobable uh, quantization um, in contrast to all the previous ones. And in that case, we get quite many bits, but the temper sensitivity is still not as good. And now when we look at the um, proposal that we made, this is profile six. So this is equidistant quantization with the LMC codes. Then we get uh, many bits out the temper sensitivity per node is uh, almost equal to the uh, quantization scenario alone, but on a device level, we are much better now. So the uh, takeaway message is that uh, temper evident puffs are important to achieve uh, the highest uh, physical security in, in a device. So just using a puff is, is not enough. Uh, physical design and the key derivation must both be optimized uh, towards temper sensitivity. So of course, uh, on a conceptual level, you need to optimize, but of course you also do need to do the practical fact checking and the attacks to really confirm that it's uh, temper evident. Uh, we formalize the temper sensitivity to better assess the various key derivation options. So I, I, I think uh, there are even better ways to do it. So this is just the start. Uh, we propose uh, this new scheme to overcome the previous limitations, and we also provide definitions uh, for uniqueness and reliability based on the Lee and Manhattan metric. So uh, if you uh, start create your own temper evident puff, uh, then you also need to, to look at how to assess the, the uniqueness and reliability, and for that you can use the Lee and Manhattan metric also. And um, yeah, for responses based on um, symbols or higher order alphabet puffs, um, which is kind of the same thing, uh, the question here is what are the benefits when applying this concept to, uh, to regular puffs? So it's just a matter of constructing them and then we can also apply the, these same concepts. And also in the case of strong puffs, we could also apply these concepts, which is a little bit outside the scope of, of previous work. And uh, for this particular topic, uh, one option uh, that I see is to investigate better uh, quantization options. Uh, so with that, I would like to conclude uh, my talk. Please see my updated uh, contact information and thank you very much for the attention. So thanks for the talk, Nitsen. Is there any question? Jim? Hi, Vincent. Uh, Hi, Jim. Nice Good presentation. So this is, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get my head wrapped around what you're doing. This is only applicable to like analog voltage types of puffs, like the capacitor that you were showing. I mean, I, I'm trying to place this into like a delay-based puff of some sort. I mean, yeah. is tamper evident is still relevant, right? Is tamper evidence relevant for all types of puffs that are out there or only these specific, only specific? specific types? Well, I, I think first of all, it depends on the scope, what you define as your puff. So of course, if your puff is just one, sm one small module in your sock, mm -hmm. it can't be tamper evident. Of course, if you drill a hole through the puff, it will be gone. But if you probe the data bus somewhere else, how is the puff supposed to protect against that? So yeah, um, okay. I, I, 
uh, yeah, if you aim for a temper evident puff, you, you need to enclose the s your circuit somehow. Yeah. And, and then what you measure, um, well, I think the capacitance is just one example, mm -hmm. but if you come up with some other physical structure uh, that you can measure uh, using an ADC, uh, let's say, and you get this type of PDF based response, then of course you, you can apply the same concept, yes. Right, so for the case that you just gave where you have a bus, right, and you probe the bus, right, it's digitized at that point. So you're assuming that tamper can flip the bit? Is that what you're assuming? So, so, sorry, I did, did not get what you... What you well, were I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to figure out what tamper means, right? Uh, ah, okay, so uh, y yes, so, so, so tampering in that case is specifically uh, invasive probing. So if we look at, let's say, uh, electro-optical probing, I think this might be more like a side channel attack mm -hmm. because you observe the bits and photons and everything and uh, yeah, I, I think that's a different direction. Okay, all right, thanks. Thank you. We have time for another question. So if there's no question, I would like to ask you a question. So thanks Vincent for the nice talk. Um, do you think is it any is there any theoretical way to distinguish between uh, the environmental noise and the tampering, which probably is coming from an yeah. adversary? Uh, I, I think that's that's very very difficult because uh, we're talking about probabilities here. So uh, if we do error correction, it's all about probabilities. So if there is some error, uh, the probability for that might be let's say 0.0001 percent. Uh, and it could be noise, but it could also be tampering. And of course, in, in case of uh, tamper evident puffs, we always need to favor the security. So we deliberately need to make the device fail to ensure security. So um, yeah, we need to have a large safety margin because right now I don't see any way to distinguish these two, unfortunately. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the response. So let's thank the speaker again.